Good afternoon, everyone. It's 3.45, so I think it's time uh, we made a start. My name's Robert Richardson, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Institute of Hospitality, and I'm here with my expert panel this afternoon to talk about the benefits of technology for a sustainable future. Now, before we get into what is quite a weighty and serious subject, I'm just going to introduce you, or rather ask uh, our panel of experts to introduce themselves. So we'll go from furthest to closest, and I'll start with uh, you, Andrew. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Coney. I'm general manager of the Harry Hotel, which is an 85-bedroom hotel over in Belgravia, uh, just off Knightsbridge. Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Kubreski. I'm the Vice President of Operations for the PPAG Hotel Group. Um, we just opened the Art Hotel in Battersea uh, uh, just over a month ago. Uh, we have one other hotel currently in uh, development, that's the Art Hotel in Hoxton. 30,000 square meters, mixed use, 27 floors, 345 bedrooms, 6,000 square meters of co-working space. Uh, we have three other hotels currently in planning two of them with secured planning permission and one other, and I look after three and a half thousand bedrooms in the UK. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Ling, and I'm a lecturer in artificial intelligence and the future of work in the Surrey Institute of People-Centered AI, and also the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. <coughs> I do research on the AI applications and implications in the service sector, especially in the tourism and hospitality industry. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, to clarify to the contrary of Robert, I don't call myself an expert, not yet at least. Um, a general manager of Fox Hills Club and Resort, uh, set in 440 acres of beautiful countryside just off uh, M25. Uh, we have over 300, uh, 300 staff members and golf club, resorts, bedrooms, conventional hotels with, uh, with uh, th over 36 holes of golf, golf clubs and that. That's what. Fabulous. And you'll certainly be uh, an expert by the end of this session. Hope so. <laughs> right. Well, jumping straight in, committing to sustainable practices is no longer a nice to have, but a must do. With more hotels, restaurants and bars being developed, how do we make our properties more sustainable? But taking that back a bit to the, to the construction and design stage, PPHE, and I'll come to you, Daniel, have one property in development, three at the planning stage, and one just open. So can we just talk through that for a few minutes? Of course, um, it's always been important to uh, understand about sustainability. Uh, it's become increasingly more so now, right through from the very first element of sustainability. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the press at the weekend. Uh, AIB, Allied Irish Banks, came out with an announcement at the weekend and they've said that they are going to reduce their carbon footprint of their, the businesses that they lend to by 67% in 2030. That's an astonishing figure. And what that means is, as a developer, you will no longer have access to capital unless you're able to hit these targets. Um, we've just secured a finance of 250, 000, sorry, 250 million euro which gives us a fund of just under half a billion euro, all for development. So where it was very, very important, it's become increasingly more so now. Then of course you move on to the next element, when you're going for your funding, so you have to have the track record initially, the next stage then is in terms of your design. Um, have you recognized that were any of you who are involved in construction will know about Bream classification? Well, Bream was the gold standard, it's already fading away. Um, the Energy and Environment, uh, Environmental Alliance, they're talking about every element of it, again, through planning, the use of materials, um, glass. Is glass something that you hang curtains on? Is it a, a source to keep heat in the building, to keep heat out of the building? Um, in terms of PV cells, will we be using it for the generation? Um, so feasibility, design, and that's then when you go on to construction itself, all of the materials, uh, how you're using for impact. The Art Hotel in Hoxton that I've said, we're in the borough of Hackney. Um, Hackney have decided as part and parcel of the planning, we're no longer allowed to have vehicles delivered to the hotel um, unless they're under a minimum size, a minimum weight, and they're all electric. 
So we're starting fantastic conversations with our linen supplier to say, I know we signed a great contract with you. I know you've agreed to what you're doing. However, do you know this is what you're going to have to change? And then again, in terms of operation, uh, how are we going to operate? What materials are we going to operate with? Um, we're currently at the end of a, believe it or not, a one year trial to introduce ionized water uh, for cleaning to replace chemicals. And you think, fantastic, that must win everywhere. You've got to bring everybody on board. We did a spot um, survey last week. We found one of the room attendants was adding chemicals to the ionized water because it didn't smell chemically enough. So we've had to tell them now we've changed our training. It's no longer ionized water. It's a special process with a secret ingredient that helps them clean the rooms quicker. So um, it's coming from everywhere. That's an awful lot you're having to deal with. It sounds really exciting. So we've looked at building infrastructure. We'll just move over to digital infrastructure. And I'm going to come to you in the first instance, Erin, if I may. So we've seen a rise over the last few years of AI in our businesses. So as example, chatbots. But how can AI move us forward in making our businesses more sustainable? So from based on my research, um, because it was very interesting, I did my PhD study on uh, chatbots. And it's so pro super popular right now. People are talking about ChatGPT, chatbot, voice assistant, uh, robotics, something like that. So uh, most of the technology was designed with the integration into the apps or softwares with itself can, can solve some sort of the problems that can have business to achieve the sustainability goals. Um, like the voice assistant, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, um, by the controlling the devices, uh, those um, sensors of the tools that lights, for example, can be turned on and off. And those part of the examples could be technology itself can have to do the, uh, for example, the energy saving part. However, another part is, is also very important is technology can also not the nudge consumers to behave um, pro-environmentally. And now, um, let's say, if in the design principles, considering the proactiveness part in the in the design principles, for example, the chatbot, uh, we have some, um, for example, hospitality uh, hotels, they have their own Wi-Fi. And when uh, consumers connected, uh, the hotel gets connected to the Wi-Fi and then pop up with this chatbot and say, if we want to do something, and then they nudge the, uh, the guest to do some certain behavior change. So we also have some research um, currently doing at, in the university with the, with the service robots. So probably we all think about, okay, so what we can do with the robots? It's just delivery, just you know, having some engagement experiences with customer. But actually we also look into the um, pro-social behavior change, how robots can actually be designed to nudge the users to behave more pro, um, in pro-social behavior. Um, asking them, you know, to engage in in some events that can support hospitality workers uh, in their well-being or for some donation with some events. So definitely, and uh, not only the design part for the technology can be used to, you know, um, act actually uh, solving some problems, but also how they can be uh, persuasive for uh, users to behave more pro-environmentally and also pro-social. Okay, that's really, really helpful. And I know, Andrew, as an operator, I think you've got a view here. Well, I guess, you know, representing luxury sector, you always have this hesitation about where does technology and AI and chatbot uh, remove that interpersonal relationship with your customer or your guest. So uh, as a sort of dinosaur or a relic of many, many years of uh, doing things my way, uh, I, I find that, you know, somewhat struggle with, you know, a number of years back, you know, press two for reservations, press three for, for group reservations. By the way, you get to number nine and press nine if you're really fed up and you just want to give up. So uh, we've got to a stage now where you talk about something like chatbot and I'm starting to sort of realize and wake up that this is so much more sophisticated and it's so much smarter and it understands the customer so much better that it can interact with them in a different way. I mean, I did a message to my wife for Valentine's Day a couple of weeks back 
and she actually thought I wrote it. It was a poem. And she actually it got me so many brownie points. So I'm right behind you now. I think it's amazing. But I'll, I'll just jump in and point out, Andrew, if your wife ever watches this in the future, because we are filming it, you might be in trouble. But okay. Thank you for the tip. <laughs> um, moving on then very swiftly. Uh, we, in my particular property, are now looking at that as a solution and we're, uh, working through several different scenarios that we will introduce because the algorithms are there, the, 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 the sophistication is there. You can actually communicate on a way more advanced level that the person feels they are actually interacting on a human level, albeit they may see through it. It just seems to work a lot more smartly. Okay, so I think we're getting a good idea how technology can support our sustainability aspirations, but how can sustain um, technology, excuse me, help measure our, our impact in sustainability? So I'll pose that question to you, if I may, Daniel. One of the first things uh, we did, because obviously I mentioned earlier, we're going to the financial markets looking for finance. Um, we have to be absolutely certain that the message we have is clear and coherent. So the very first thing we've done is um, do uh, a measurability uh, study in terms of that. Uh, we had a look in terms of scope one. So uh, materiality, so what's scope one? Scope one is what you produce. Well, generally in hotels, with the exception potentially of water and waste, we don't necessarily produce that much. Um, scope two is in terms of power usage. Uh, so what power are you using? Um, so we made the decision, all of the power we use, whilst it's more expensive, is certified as renewable. Um, coming through on that. Again, in terms of the design and the construction, in Hoxton, we made the decision, even though it is more expensive, no use of gas, apart from one or two small pieces of kit that we can't change, everything yep. is electrical. And then in terms of scope three, it's the total supply chain. So that's when it comes to your procurement department in terms then of doing the assessments. Um, again, I thought I had a great, a great idea on that. You know, when we were opening Westminster Bridge, so 1,012 bedrooms, sorry, 1,019 bedrooms, meetings and events for over 1,000 people, when we opened that, I said, it's great. We're going to have lots and lots of small independent suppliers all in line with the, the food chain, reaching out to the local communities. When I then presented my facts then to the assessor who's assessing us, they said, you must be joking. You've absolutely multiplied your carbon footprint by a significant element. It's actually more sustainable to have one truck coming from 3663 rather than 20 or 30 little Citroen vans with independent suppliers and coming in. So it's, it's not simple. Um, yeah. So the first thing that we have is in terms of measuring that and measuring everything else. Um, we also, we, we now have somebody at a director level who's migrating and helping us through all of this. So his role was originally in terms of compliance uh, because again, we're listed on the FTSE 250. So, um, and it's now expanded as this become more and more important. And he gave me a great example in terms of, uh, you can't look at it on a single level. You have to go much, much deeper. So um, if I was a fast food chain who um, currently uh, purchase all of my beef from British and Irish farmers and coming through, and if we look at it on a very simple level to go, actually it's much more sustainable buying a, uh, Argentinian beef, yeah, in terms of that. You go, that's fine, we bring everything from Argentina. What you've done then is you've actually haven't taken into account the social impact. So what happens to the farms? What happens to the local communities? What happens to the suppliers? Um, so in, in answer to the question, um, you have to measure. You have to know what you're measuring. And then you have to challenge yourself on, are you measuring on a simplistic level or are you measuring on a much deeper level? So on one of the rare occasions, um, I would suggest find a consultant, okay? Find people who specialize, challenge them on what they're doing and have an understanding. Okay, and coming across to you, Tej, would you have a, a view here? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, Foxels is, uh, it's, um, it's made up of nine, eight to nine different buildings, actually. The, the oldest is, uh, you can say, early 19th century to the newest building opened uh, 
almost two years back. So we have got additional challenge of the fact that how we migrate all the old buildings into much more sustainable, energy efficient. So in the new build, new of the building, which was the family building, which opened, uh, it's a 1700 square meter of uh, family space, which we opened in the May of 21. We have got something like DAISY system, which reduces the chlorine. We have got five pools. So we measured it that it has, that building has also got two pools and the, uh, we use the much more innovative system called DAISY system, which actually reduced the chlorine, which not only helped us from the cost point of view, but also had an impact. The other thing is also, we, as Robert, if I take it back to you when you invited me, as I said to you, Foxhills is kind of, I call it a very infancy stage of sustainability. We have, because of, it's a privately owned, has been, we have a different, we are actually have just started the conversation and we are taking, Daniel, as you mentioned, we are in process of uh, tying up with the consultant and all that to help us in the journey because otherwise we have a fear that we will end up doing a lot of small, small things which are not joined together. And as a result, the impact of it, which will be, I guess, negated or minimalistic. So that's what we are doing right now. And I would, and I would recommend that they, if you do not have an in-house expertise like us, that will be the best thing to do. Yeah, and I can can agree more. So we've talked an awful lot about our build. I say an awful lot. We've been here twenty minutes, but we've covered an awful lot. We've talked a lot about our business's premises, so the physical four walls and roof. But moving the conversation along to our people, so our customers, teams, guests. We've seen a lot over the last few years, and in fact, you'll see it a lot as you walk the floor of the show today, a lot of um, robotics in hospitality, so robot waiters, bartenders, so on and so forth. Do we think within our industry, would our audiences accept a rise in robotic teams if it meant the property had a greater impact in terms of sustainability? So I'm going to stay with you for that for a minute, Ted, if I may. I think um, the answer is actually, I'm not sitting on a fence, but the answer is yes and no. To introduce is, first of all, I think you need to know your customer. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I can take, again, I'll take back to personal experience. Fox Hills, we have a demography where uh, we have a right mix of uh, demography of people which use the Fox Hills day in, day out. And when we have introduced technology, and we realize that technology only covers certain demography or background or age group of people, and then we have to have something which needs to be uh, which needs to be user friendly for the other. So I think the key is, yes, technology can help, but at the same time, I think the key is you need to know your system. You need to know your uh, audience very well because otherwise you, and also we can have like, for example, I would say self mobile check-in. Okay. I'll give you a perfect, very, it is quite common, but, uh, when we have it, the demography of what we use, 50% of the customers are very familiar with it. They prefer that. The other 50% of the, they want key card because they are not at all uh, comfortable with that. And that kind of a thing. But that doesn't mean the technology isn't right yep. or isn't working. It is just the fact that we need to know our customers as well. And we need to be ag agile enough that we can tweak our offering mm. by using the technology to suit each, indi each individual. And Erin, if I may, you're nodding along, and I know you've got some expertise in the field of robotics, so would you like to jump into the conversation? Sure. Um, so, first of all, I, I do think um, it really depends on the design of the technology itself. Um, so, for sus sustainability, the goals, most of the time, it actually works the bag of house for the, for the let's say, uh, food waste, energy saving. Uh, however, robotics work in front of a house and consumer facing. So whether it's used for just for the interaction with consumers or it designed for a particular purpose with the sustainability goals, um, it, it will vary quite differently. So um, if we say just for the interaction, it, it really requires research on the it's not working. I think we have okay. a mic issue sorry. there, so. My bad. I can't, I can't. Is it working now? The technology's not working. Oh, okay, sorry. But I just the irony of the subject that we're talking about. Oh, so. no, sorry. Um, okay. Okay, I hold it. Uh, so, yeah, my point is now, 
about with this, uh, it really depends on the design of the technology. So um, most of the time, the back of house already did part of the uh, energy saving, uh, food waste, for example. But robotics work in front of the house and most, most of the time um, consumer facing. And even for those robots working in the kitchen, they are designed with a very particular focus that is designed for making the food or is designed for having the conversation with uh, your hotel guests. So in order to achieve the sustainable goals, it really has to uh, consider the design principles in how I'm gonna use these robots and what why I'm using it now and what kind of goals I'm achieving it. So I just mentioned about the research I just talked about earlier about uh, service robots nudging the consumers. So we want to make it work as a nudging effect. So we know when we, we need to design this one, we want to achieve this goal that you, consumers will achieve, the, will behave, have some behavior change based on that. But most of the time in hotels now, robots are delivering the food and do the check-in, check-out, these kind of uh, functions. So it doesn't have really much to do with the sustainability, to be honest. And so um, we need to do some research and even with we assume that robots can work um, in a sustainability way that we still need to do the research whether it really works in that way. So I think the key here is it requires it requires research and quite a bit of research to test whether it can achieve the um, impact on the sustainability. Yeah. Okay, that's very useful. I'm going to take that point and move over to Andrew. So Andrew's hotel operates in the luxury end of the market. How do you feel your guests would react to a rise of uh, robots in the operation? Um, I think from a forward front facing guest perspective, I think at the moment we're still at quite a gimmicky stage. Uh, I was in Qatar last year and they had a robot in the lobby that was progressing around and delivering water to people and people found it very amusing and it was rather sort of unique but it's actual practicalities and if you wanted to then interact with the, with the robot there was no ability to do so. So I think there's quite a bit of work to be done. I would endorse entirely what you just said from a production perspective, a cleaning perspective and a maintenance perspective, there's huge opportunity but it's all back of house. And uh, Daniel, I know you've got some experience here, so could we just come to you on the subject? Sure. Um, we have uh, what we call Johnny Robot. Uh, so Johnny Robot is an admin robot. Um, so we introduced him into the business about five years ago, and that was just automating, you know, boring, repetitive tasks in terms of what we had. So uh, reservations, settling of accounts using the purchasing system and all of that absolutely perfect uh, they tried to expand it into some other areas didn't work whatsoever slash return move on the second example uh, again just more technology rather than robots uh, during covid uh, we automated uh, room service order taking everybody thought fantastic solution it's great paperless remove everything from the bedrooms and we had a reaction and it was working one of the gms um, who never listens to me reprinted the menus, put them up in the bedroom. And when I commended him on the weekly call over, how come your sales are up 30%? He said, because we put the hard copy back in uh, where it goes. So absolutely fantastic. And the last example, um, we're in the process of putting a robot in um, Westminster Bridge. Uh, when the representatives came to us, they said, great, the robot will deliver all your food, deliver all your beverage and back to your point. And we said under no circumstances. So we think we're going to use the robot for can you send me up some toilet roll? Yeah. Uh, can you send me up some shampoo? Um, a letter from concierge. So going for novelty. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what we can't do in terms of the customer is give the customer the feeling that we're taking away from his overall experience. And even you know you're very fortunate in terms of the area, area end of the market you work at. You know we're in the volume area. Different scale. Uh, yeah, but you think mm -hmm. oh that's an absolutely perfect go 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 and we've said under no circumstances. So everything has a use. And again, it's just about challenging. Good, I think we're coming to quite a concise point here. So staying on the subject of people and indeed with yourself, Daniel, if I might for a minute, um, do you think there's a case, certainly as we're in a people and skills crisis in our industry at the moment, that our team's own sustainability values being reflected in our organization, does that improve, do we think, our retention? 
We're very fortunate. We started uh, three weeks ago with our graduate program. So they're really important for us in terms of our pipeline. We take anywhere between 10 and 15 graduates coming into the business, depending on, on them. <clears throat> uh, on the first set of interviews we did, out of the first 10 graduates we interviewed, six of them asked about our sustainability uh, process in the first three questions. Mm. Not, not in the course of the interview, it was so important in their first three questions. Uh, we do staff surveys uh, twice a year. Based on the feedback we've had in the next survey that we run in April, we're actually asking them if, if uh, our process and our approach to it is sufficient and what can we do uh, off the basis of it. So um, it is, we all know there's a war on talent. Mm. It's about finding them. It's about keeping them. It's about keeping them engaged. Um, and the great thing, you know, I wish I was 21 again because I had to fight bloody hard for everything I had growing up in my career. Now it's the employers are fighting. And I think that's fantastic. You know, uh, if I don't do it well enough, they're straight over to Belgravia. Yeah. Um, so, no, we've, we've, we've got to do it. Well said. And I really, I couldn't agree more. So staying on that point, Erin, can we just come to you for a second and see if you have, please? Hopefully the mic's going to work. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so... Yes, definitely, I think. Um, from the point of view of, like, the, um, let's say, the consumers, they are actually, the consumers prefer to choose the organizations, like, whether they can see in the values are reflected uh, with the organization, the actions, their goals are actually reflected in the actions. But those are actually the intention to choose those hotels based on the environmental sustainability. And while we all, most of the time, we focus on the sustain, um, environmental sustainability, we sometimes forget or, or overlook the importance of social sustainability, which is also a very important part uh, how we can attract people and how we can retain people. And talking about uh, the recruitment and the retention in this industry, um, this sector, we highly, I assume, very largely rely on the, also the female, and we, we have this gender issues um, in, in, the, in the labor market as well. So uh, having how to attract them, how to retain them is not really about, um, you know, having more people, get them, recruit them and in the team and we have, you know, uh, have no problem in, in the recruitment, but also how we can actually make them stay. We know the internships from the graduates from university every year. We have no problem with them, with, with this, you know, and the investment, with the price, with everything, how, how much we're gonna pay. However, to let them stay in this sector, in this hotel, just for three or five years mm -hmm. is, is, is really challenging. And so I had, I had the owner, owner last week, um, uh, two weeks ago, we had a workshop on the women in AI. We talk about the biases, about uh, how women are actually, uh, um, you know, looked in the workplace. And because this industry also, uh, we have large number of female workers. So we need to think about this also, the promotion and um, the, the ability to let them to balance the work and the life and how, how to schedule their work. And it's all about the social sustainability as well. So a key point here for me is, uh, while environmental sustainability is important, uh, we also need to focus more on the social sustainability to uh, retain more um, employers. Sure, and that's actually a perfect segue into my next question, so thank you very much. Andrew, you took it a step further, and last year you appointed a sustainability executive. So what, what exactly is that? Um, let me put it into context. So we're an 85 bedroom hotel. It's a small boutique hotel. Uh, so therefore space is very limited, um, particularly back of house. And I felt that over the past few years, we've been paying lip service to our sustainability responsibility. And we were ticking boxes, but I think we were facing increasing pressure from uh, a number of uh, organizations we wanted to work with. Uh, I'm talking about agencies and corporate accounts who now have a requirement for you to really prove that your sustainability is something you're mm. taking seriously. So drew a line in the sand and decided to employ somebody on a full-time basis 
to be responsible for driving our sustainability within the building and beyond within our local community. So we took on somebody who's uh, had credentials already, had uh, qualifications in sustainability and environmental practice, and she's been with us just over a year now. And I think to the point that, you know, I think it's sometimes important that big, big organizations uh, have resource. We had no resource and it was time to do something a little bit more pioneering and sort of trailblaze, I hope, to other hotels that if you take somebody on, there's a challenge to start changing hearts and minds within your building because there's a degree of cynicism both within your employment uh, or with, amongst your employees, but also with people who are supplying you. So you need somebody with a force of character that will drive the message and win hearts and minds that uh, this is worthwhile doing. And one of the things that we've seen as an uplift of it all is there is actually savings to be made. So her salary is starting to be supplemented or benefiting from us now recycling in, in ways that we had never contemplated before, such as things like oil, which is now taken away from the building and we get paid for it. Things like the amenities in bedrooms that we've now gone down a very different route and we're saving so much money and not spending a fortune on little plastic bottles that are then disappearing into the ocean or wherever. So it, it was a real change of heart for me. It was a big, big decision to take because uh, you know it, it is a salary uh, and an un unusual step to potentially take. But uh, we are certainly seeing the benefits of it now. And, uh, and I think hand on heart, I can, I can feel that we're doing our part and being very much more responsible than we were. And can I ask Andrew, obviously you touch on the fact that it is a salaried role and not one that overtly generates revenue, although you found it made savings as you went. Was that a hard sell with the hotel owners when you first spoke about the idea? No, not remotely. Um, it, it, it was viewed that if, if we could trailblaze and we could set an example, it, it would look favorably upon us in many respects. Um, and, and, and set an example. So I think they were happy to, to, to spearhead that and lead from the front like that. Okay, brilliant. And we're going for accreditation this year uh, with EarthCheck. We got our bronze accreditation last year and we're, we're hoping for silver in a couple of months time. So from an owner's perspective, they can see tangible benefit that uh, you know, we have taken this seriously and we're getting results. Fantastic. Now I'm conscious of time. We've talked an awful lot about systems and procedures and I think my next question I'm going to come to you if I may Tej. We all know in our businesses when we introduce a new system, a new piece of technology, a new procedure, it's another job basically, it's another thing to do. Is there a danger that the more we introduce the more we overcomplicate the operation? Uh, I, I think it that is not the issue. I think it is when we implement something and if the staff are not fully on board or not trained then there is always a fear. You, you took a perfect example, Daniel, where you said about the, uh, the ionized water and that we see it um, in and out. So it is, if you know your market well, as I highlighted uh, in the earlier part of the, uh, of, of the conversation and you have introduced a technology which is necessity and complements your business, I think with, it's a human factor, right? If you, we are, we are programmed that sometimes we have fear changes or we don't like or we are slow to respond to the changes. But if we reflect that and we train our staff well to do it, actually, then uh, it help it will actually help over the period. And I think on the other hand, I used to also acknowledge the fact that majority of the ideas of simplify the whether it is using technology or just simplifying the process, they generally come from the frontline staff because they are the ones who are the who are in the front and they are the ones who are using it those whether it's a technology or whether it's the systems and processes and actually listening to them not everything you can implement or change but at least listening to them and making sure that they are trained it is essential mm. and if the business needs it then it zoom I say you know it was launched what 2010 and 11 but to be honest I never heard of it I never used it and uh, before COVID would I have used it no, because I would have said, you know what, I will go and visit that it is, I'll pick up a phone. But as I said, it was necessity, right? Go lockdown and we ended up using and it zoomed. I totally agree. And at that point, I'm going to give my voice a rest and I'm going to go out to our audience with any questions, if I may. I think Annabelle has a, a mic. So if anyone's got a question. Or are we going with stun silence?
the irony that this is a technology uh, panel. Sorry. Thanks a lot. Um, with the advent of things like ChatGPT and uh, version 4 recently released, how long does people like Andrew um, and Daniel think that, and Tej, before the likes of concierge services, reception services will be taken over totally in the different markets? Who'd like to pick that up? You just have to have a look at what booking.com has done to reservations. So um, any of you in the audience are old enough to have trained in a reservations department, okay? And when I was doing my training management, I sat in there, all I did was answer the telephone and every second week they then stuck me on the telex or the fax, okay? <laughs> Booking.com completely revolutionized that. So um, one of my roles was I was also ran our central reservations office. I had 70 agents in 2012 who were predominantly taking telephone calls. We are now down to 35 agents and only five of those agents take telephone calls. The balance then have become customer service agents. So there is that transition and it is happening um, and, and where, where it's coming. But again, we go back to, it doesn't really matter if the customer is getting what they want. And we also have the opportunity to enhance the, uh, the customer experience. So one of the things that we've added in this year's budget, although I haven't been able to recruit them yet, some of the savings we made from customer service allowed me to hire additional lobby hosts to put the lobby hosts in to try and get that connection. So I, I think it is, um, it, 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 is, it is coming, it's here, it's ahead of us. And as per usual, yeah. Crystal ball time. I'd, I'd, I'd say months rather than, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, I think it was, we, we did a study, 35% of all calls coming into the customer service were asking us, do you have car parking or where's the nearest, where's the nearest tube station? You know, that was costing us tens of thousands of pounds because we didn't have it. So as soon as I can get somebody on that, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Yeah. We've got time for one last question, ladies and gentlemen. Don't be shy. No? Okay, right, you're getting off easy. So my last question, because we are coming up to time, and uh, is if my panel here were to give the audience one top tip that they could take away today and implement in their own business, what would that tip be? So I'm going to go again furthest to closest and start with you, Andrew. What would your top tip be for our audience today? Take it way more seriously than you probably have done. Uh, there's a lot of fun to be had out of sustainability. And I think sometimes we get a little bit too bogged down and telling our people that it's all about putting this in that bin and that in that bin, and that it just isn't particularly enlightening or engaging a, 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 a set of circumstances to talk about. So we've started taking our team out and we've started having them plant trees in Hyde Park, uh, which was done in the pouring rain and it was really hard slog digging up big parts of Hyde Park, but it was so worthwhile and they really got a kick out of it. And when they know that that's connected to what we're doing back in the hotel and it's part of our social outreach, and it's all part of sustainability and well-being in, encased in one, make it fun, just make it, Make it fun. less of something that you're imposing, but something that they can participate in. Another one, you know, a lot of my people come to work on the tube and the bus. We've got bicycles at the hotel. And they've never even dreamt of cycling anywhere before. So we had a fun day out on bicycles. And then some of them now converting to, well, yeah, actually, the hotel's also going to help me buy a bicycle. I'm going to cycle to work from now on. So there's, there's ways of just sort of connecting better. Brilliant. Thank you. And coming to you, Daniel, if I may. So mine is to do with the E of ESG, environmental uh, electricity costs, utility costs, in terms of managing those. Um, we talk about making it fun. How do you get the commitment? You'll get the commitment from the team members if you engage them in your team member forums. Secondly, we change the balance scorecard for all of our leadership team. Um, so they get exactly the same percentage for their bonus for customer service 
as they do for uh, reducing utility costs. In our oldest hotel, we reduced uh, taking 2019 as a base level by 7%. In our most efficient hotel, we reduced it by 34% in terms of utility usage. Um, and please go back to your hotels. If you have demisters in your bathrooms, take a hammer to them, okay? That used more electricity than everything else we used in the bedroom when we did the tests on that. Okay, so we've got make it fun, break a bathroom, yeah. and to you, Erin. Now it's time for deeper for me, right? Uh, I would say do not delay. Start to invest like who are your key customers and what they really want. Uh, a key point is to really ensure that uh, guests' intention to use technology is important. If they have the resistance to use the technology, all this will offset or sustainability goals. So a, a different technology work really different way for different customer groups. So know where they are from, who are your, your main customer group and what they need or they require are very different. So many different types of technology there and different systems. And, but it doesn't mean that you need to invest all the technology has to make it fancy or look it, you know, really cool. But make sure what kind of benefits it can bring to the organization, to your employee or to the consumers. And, and do not delay because technology yeah. is changing so fast. And once you have, you know, think about uh, how much research I need to do to test whether it will really work, it's too delay and we have new the system coming out already. Fabulous. And to you, Tej. I'll be short because there's an old technology of sign languages <laughs> coming that we are running late. Uh, water res resilience, because of the fact that we have 440 acres to maintain and water is the current project what we are, so that we are self-sufficient of golf courses and also water resilience is one of the things which we are currently working on. From the staff point of view, I think staff are already bought in because young staff nowadays, especially at my establishment, they question what is our sustainability. So actually they are already bought and it is us who have to choose how to get those costing in the short term to put it in the business. Fantastic. Thank and you. I think we are coming in just on time. So really pleased with that. Thank you very much to my panel of experts. We had a lot to get through today and I think they've done a fantastic job. So could we just have a round of applause, please? <laughs>